Lives Changed by the Good News, Part 1. Our main text today will be in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. In a few short days, we remember, observe, celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, God the Son. But not everyone believes and celebrates. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, some doubted the resurrection of Jesus Christ had actually occurred. So, in God's word, it was indeed addressed that he had indeed risen from the dead. The question from some, does it have an effect, an impact on my life today? Well, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and see how the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection changed the lives of believers and, of course, changed the lives of unbelievers bringing them to salvation through Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, as we open our Bibles, let us start with verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel, that's the good news. The Greek there is euangelion, good news, good tidings, which I preach to you, which also you received, in which you also stand by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Who are those who believe in vain? This type of belief is a belief in the existence of God, but not personally calling upon Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We saw this earlier in our studies in James chapter 2, verse 19. The demons believe in the existence of God, and their fear is so great, they even shudder, they shake. But this is not saving faith. There are people who believe in the existence of God, but they have not, at least they have yet not, called personally upon Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Here in verse 2, the reference here is, you are saved. The Greek there is sozo. It means to keep safe, to save, to rescue from danger. We see this reflected in the Old Testament in Passover. It's the reference in the New Testament is the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Passover, God released the children of Israel from slavery to the Egyptians and set them free, saved them, and brought them to the promised land. The unleavened bread that they ate was eaten in haste because they did not have time for the dough to uh, rise, so they did not put leaven in. Because God was going to move so quickly, they did not have time to waste, thus the unleavened bread. The Greek New Testament, two words for this time of year are given. Passover and resurrection. Passover, that which how God delivered the children of Israel in the Old Testament, is still referred to in the New Testament. But at this point, The emphasis of the Lord at Passover going to the cross and his death, burial, and resurrection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, it states it most clearly. Christ, our Passover. Verse 3 in chapter 15. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Last week, we saw 1 John chapter 1 there in verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Salvation is indeed the work of God. Notice how God does this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Many things are going on uh, in salvation. Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and at the same time, the Lord himself bore our sins on the cross. Notice in verse 4, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to scriptures. The Lord referenced this, that he was going to the cross, He told the disciples that he would rise again on the third day. It's even reflected. As they gathered in the upper room, the Lord took of the Passover meal, the Passover Seder, the unleavened bread. But when it came that time in the Passover Seder, 
The unleavened bread was no longer the bread of haste. In 1 Corinthians 11, chapter, the Lord said, This is my body, which is for you. The Lord changed the words. 1 Corinthians 11, when he then came to the cup, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. The Lord had explained to them what was going to happen, but how could they fully understand exactly the wonderful work that God was going to do to save us? Notice that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to scriptures. Now in chapter 15, down in verse 12, resurrection is listed there in verse 12. Anastasis. It means two meanings in New Testament Greek. Anastasis will refer to when we rise up from sitting, but it also refers to rise from the dead. The word anastasis is used in both cases. If you'll notice in funerals, uh, we often invite the congregation, please rise, and we're not asking anyone to rise from the dead. We're just asking them to stand from a seated position. But the word in Greek is the same. In John the 11th chapter, when Jesus goes to the tomb of Lazarus, and he commands Lazarus to come forth. Lazarus does so, but he can only do it after God has produced his own resurrection, anastasis. Just as in salvation, we cannot save ourselves. God is the one who saves us. But he still gives us the command that we're to call upon him. But salvation is indeed God's work. Anastasis derives from the dead. Resurrections are both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Enoch and Elijah do not physically die. They just go directly to be with God. Very different cases. But Jesus' resurrection is different from those who died and were resurrected from the dead. They were resurrected from the dead, but yet they died again after that point. Jesus is the first fruits of resurrection. Because when Jesus rises from the dead on the third day, it's with a glorified body, an eternal glorified body. This resurrection is different from the ones that God the Father, God the Son, and his prophets, those who, in obedience to him, did what he commanded them to do. This resurrection was different. It was a resurrection to eternal life. Not just physical life, but eternal life in a very different glorified body, which is promised for all those who have come to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The Greek here is half risen. The Greek tense means it's something that has happened in the past, but its state and the consequences are continuing. His resurrection was not temporary to die again, as had been in the past. His resurrection was indeed eternal. So we rejoice not in our Lord's death, for that was responsible because of our sin, nor in his burial, but we do indeed rejoice with his resurrection. And although it pains even us what our Lord had to go through because of our sin, we do rejoice in what God accomplishes through this marvelous, costly, to God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, very costly to them, but it's free to us. Now, our Lord's death and resurrection, some believe receiving the grace of God with saving faith. Some believe in God's existence, but do not have a saving faith in God. How does the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection impact my life? Well, when we come back in part two, we'll see three different examples in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 of the way it impacted three different people and their lives and see how it applies to us.